I hope that you guys had an awesome night. Um, so it's so, so cool if we really are able to take our past and maybe our past that has kind of controlled us and really truly lay that before God. And that's not a, always a one-time thing. That can be an everyday surrender um, to God and keep bringing that back. But I know a friend of mine um, that kind of experienced this recently and she like came to me the next day. She was like, I literally got on the scale because I thought I lost weight. Like I thought, I, I think that, so if anyone had any weight loss last night, um, you know, it's pretty awesome. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about our present. Um, not too long ago, uh, I was traveling and I ended up getting um, to have breakfast with my parents. They were in Kentucky at the time. And so that was kind of cool, getting to do that. And we were sitting in one of those um, breakfast places that kind of had TVs um, surrounding us. And it seemed like everywhere we looked, we were surrounded by bad news. I was like, well, this is a very depressing breakfast, you know? It was like rising dead over here and unemployment and healthcare and what. ISIS did and there was a school shooting and there was teacher strikes and all this crazy stuff was going on. I mean, don't you feel that way sometimes? Like we're just surrounded by bad news. Um, watch the local news and right before they go to commercial, they'll be like, can you really trust your child's popsicles? Find out when you get back. And you're like, wait, what? Take that out of your mouth right now. You know, we're freaking out. Um, and then during the commercial break, there's some new drug being promoted and the disclaimer is like longer than the commercial, right? If you or your family or caregiver knows this agitation, hostility, depression, or changes in behavior, thinking, mood that are not typical for you, or if you develop suicidal thoughts or actions, anxiety, panic, aggression, anger, mania, abnormal sensations, hallucinations, paranoia, or confusion, stop taking and call your doctor right away. Also tell your doctor if you have any history of depression or mental health problems before taking, as these symptoms may worsen while taking. Some people can have serious skin reactions while taking, some of which can become life-threatening. These can include rash, swelling, redness, and peeling of the skin. Some people have allergic reactions to, which can be life-threatening and include swelling of the face, mouth, throat and can cause trouble breathing. If you have these symptoms or a rash with peeling skin or blisters in the mouth, stop taking and get medical attention right away. In clinical trials, the most common side effects include nausea, sleep problems, <laughs> constipation, gas, vomiting. These are not all the side effects. Ask your doctor or pharmacist for more information, right? <laughs> and you kind of want to go, can I get a prescription for fear? Because... <laughs> I am a little freaked out about our world today. And so many of us can feel like, how in the world could we live with purpose and with meaning? How can we live courageous lives when it feels very out of our control? What's happening? Well, we're gonna jump into this real life story of a girl today, um, and her name is Esther. And so you, she's got a whole book of the Bible. If you wanna turn to Esther, if you don't know where that is, table of contents is your best friend. Um, jump into Esther. <coughs> um, and this book, um, the best way to describe it is just drama, okay? Because it is full of wild parties and beauty pageants and murder conspiracy and social networking and defiance and challenge and risk and egos and plotting and planning and brilliance and triumph and defeat. There's twists and turns. There's nothing boring about the story of Esther and her life. And since it is such a dramatic book, what I thought we would do this morning is kind of break it up into some different scenes, okay? So, and I think this is gonna help us with our todays, okay? We're gonna reach back into history and we're gonna learn something about our today. So scene one is called uh, The Hangover. Beginning of chapter one tells us that King Xerxes is in power over 127 provinces. I mean, he was the ruler at the time of the entire Persian empire, which would make him the most powerful man in the world at the time. And being the most powerful man in the world, he knew how to do a lot of things, including throwing a party. So scene one, chapter one begins with Xerxes throwing this huge party for everybody who was anybody, right? Military leaders and princes, everybody was there. And it says in verse four, for a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. And you think that you've pulled some all-nighters, okay? This party that Xerxes threw in honor of himself lasted half the year. And if 180 days wasn't long enough, after that the king threw another seven-day banquet for everybody in Susa, right there in the capital. 
And by the king's edict, there was no limit placed on drinking for this seven day period. Usually you could drink, you know, when the king gave a toast and everybody would drink. Not this week. It was like, everybody, we can be going 180 days already. So everybody at this point, just have as much as you want. And so on the last day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, which I think may be an understatement after a 186 day kegger, um, he sent some of his men to go get Queen Vashti and bring her out before them wearing her royal crown. And many scholars believe wearing only the royal crown because he wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze upon her beauty for she was a very beautiful woman. And Queen Vashti was not down with that. And she refused to go. She refused to come and this made the king furious. And he burned with anger. So he, he gathered some advisors to figure out, what do I do with this queen? She's disrespected me. She's humiliated me. She's disobeyed me. And they suggested that he have Vashti banished and also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. They're like, okay, you can do better. Like, let's find you someone better. And so they proposed that a search be made of all the young, beautiful virgins in every province of Xerxes' realm. Let's give them all beauty treatments. And then let's let the girl that pleases the king the most be made queen instead of Vashti. And so, um, chapter two, verse four, we're flying through Esther, by the way. If you just wanna follow on the screens, that's cool. Chapter two, verse four, this advice appealed to the king. You think, right? <laughs> Sounds like a plan. So he followed it, which brings us to scene two, um, The Bachelor. We have got... <laughs> All of these beautiful young virgin women being rounded up and brought to the citadel of Susa. I mean, I can only imagine how many, but there's only one rose, right? There's only one crown to be handed out. And before a girl's turn came to go into the king, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with oil and myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. I mean, 12 months is a long time. And this wasn't like an extended spa treatment. So many of us are like, that sounds amazing. Sign me up, I'm out, you know. The, can you imagine all of these girls, these young girls in the same place, how much pressure there would be? All trying to get one crown, the jealousy, the competition, the comparing going on. I mean, this was made for reality TV. And among this group of women was this young woman named Esther, a Jewish orphaned girl who had been raised by her cousin, Mordecai. Mordecai was a Jewish man who had been taken captive um, from Jerusalem under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. You may remember some of this. He is one of these displaced Jewish people. Like they're not in captivity anymore, but they're not really at home anywhere. They're just scattered throughout the region. And I like Mordecai. And I think it's so cool how he cares for his cousin throughout this story. It tells us in verse seven that when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and he raised her as his own daughter. And then in verse 11, after Esther had been taken to the bachelor pad, it said that every day Mordecai would kind of walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. He cared about her. He wanted to know what was going on and that's why he instructed Esther to keep, you know, what might, what might be a good thing for you to kind of maybe have an advantage in this, you know, contest of becoming queen? Just kind of keep your family background a secret. Your heritage, the Jewish heritage, not gonna win you any popularity points, so let's just keep that a secret and so she did. And out of all the women brought to Susa, Esther, just as she was, won the admiration of everyone who saw her, including the king. It had been four years since Queen Vashti had been banished. I mean, I am sure there were plenty of beautiful young girls he could have chosen in those four years, but Esther won his favor, so he set a royal crown on her head and he made her queen instead of Vashti. At the end of the day, this Jewish orphan girl raised by her displaced cousin, maybe the most unlikely, won the rose. Scene three, criminal mind. Um, <laughs> unlike Cinderella and they lived happily ever after, um, it, the plot kind of thickens for this orphan girl, right? Things are a little out of her control. 
There are a few criminal minds in this story, Bigthana Teresh and a guy named Haman. And interestingly enough, Mordecai ends up being the lead undercover investigator in every one of these cases. So Mordecai, he's got this job at the king's gate. And one day he overhears two of the king's guards, Bigthana and Teresh, plotting to assassinate the king. So Mordecai goes to Esther, who reports it to the king, and when they investigate and find out that it's actually true, that these two guys lost their lives. And they gave all the credit to Mordecai for kind of uncovering this and reporting it to the king. And it says in verse 23 that all this was recorded in the book of history of King Xerxes' reign. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Then there was the criminal mind of Haman. Um, we can boo. Can we just boo one time for Haman? Haman, boo, yes. And just like most great villains, Haman is on the inside, right? Right? He's the right-hand guy of the king. He's the highest ranking official in the empire. I mean, his position is so high, when he passes by other officials, they all bow down because there goes Haman except for one guy. This Jewish man who believed in only bowing to the one true God and his name was Mordecai and he was at the king's gate and so day after day, Haman passes by the king's gate. Everyone bows, Mordecai doesn't and this makes Haman furious. In fact, he was so filled with rage, he decided he had to do something about it. And he had learned of Mordecai's nationality. So he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. Okay, he is more than a little mad. Mordecai is not the problem. It's these people that are a problem. So in the month of April, they cast lots. Like they rolled the dice to see what would be a good day on the calendar to annihilate the Jews. And they landed on March 7th of the next year. I mean, calendar's free. Let's book it. That's the day. And so Haman goes to the king to get him to sign off on his plan. And what he explains to the king is, hey, there's like this certain race of people. They're scattered kind of throughout the provinces. They're different from everyone else. They keep these different laws. And he just said, we'd be better off if we kind of took their possessions and took them over. And the king says, okay, the money and the people are yours to do with as you see fit. And so later on that week, April 17th, a decree was written, it's translated into the language of every province, and it's sent with messengers to deliver them, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. Can you imagine? I mean, this is a horrific evil plan from the mind of a really evil man. But can you think about what it would have been like for the Jewish people to have these messengers coming into town and on the front page it reads, on March 7th, you and those closest to you are going to be killed? Can you imagine having a date on the calendar? Can you imagine having 11 months to anticipate your death and the death of those closest to you? It's out of control. Well, as the news spread, the entire Jewish community began to weep and wail and they cover themselves in burlap and ashes, which was a traditional manner of just begging God to intercede on their behalf. And when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he too tore his clothes and he put on burlap and ashes and he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. Well, the news about Mordecai weeping and wailing in, in the city, that travels to Esther, and she's like, what in the world is going on with my cousin, you know, my adopted father? So she sends a messenger named Hattach to find out what's going on, and Mordecai tells her the whole story, everything that's going on, and then he also asks Hattach to direct her to go to the king and beg for mercy and plead for her people. And Esther sent back a reply that went something like this. You have got to be kidding me. <laughs> I can't do that. Everyone knows that going to the king uninvited is against the law. Like it's punishable by death. The only exception is if when the king sees me, he holds out his gold scepter, but I don't see that happening. This is literally what she says. We've been married for five years and he hasn't asked for me in 30 days. So not a good time to be showing up and in revealing my secret heritage 
asking the king for any favors. This is too risky. This is life or death. You can't ask this of me. This is too much to ask of me. And she had to believe her response would be sufficient. That Mordecai would go, oh my goodness, you're right. I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. That is too crazy. I didn't want to risk you to risk it like that. But instead, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Not what Esther was expecting to hear. Mordecai is reminding her that although she's queen and she's living this plush life in the castle and she's got that walk-in closet with the name brand clothes, she's still Jewish And this decree applies to her and even if somehow she lets it play out and she escapes it, those closest to her will not. And he asks her in an out of control present situation, he asks her to find some courage, to not back down, to not take the easy way out. That who knows, you may have been made queen for such a time as this. You see, the opposite of courage is not fear, it is self-preservation. It is wanting to protect ourselves and shield ourselves and keep ourselves and keep our present, not out of control, but totally in our control. When I was four years old, um, my grandmother, who's amazing, um, she bought me an Easter gift and it was, she came in with this little cardboard box and it was a little duckling. I mean, it was adorable and very fuzzy. And I mean, what kind of cool Easter present is that for a four-year-old? And I loved this little duckling and I held it and I petted it and I squeezed it and I held it and I squeezed it. Yeah, I killed the duck. I totally, I, I loved that thing to death. I loved it to death. Um, I still kind of feel bad about that. Um, my dad said it went to a better place. Um, but we have the tendency to do this with our lives sometimes, to just love it to death, to, to cling and to hold and to guard our lives with such a vengeance that we miss out on what God actually has for us, that we could literally hold and protect and squeeze and embrace and cuddle and shelter the life right out of our lives. Dr. Kieran H. Job says this about Esther which is so true about us, she had to overcome herself in order to do what God had created her and positioned her to do. Have you ever had to overcome yourself? Have you ever been there? God has created you and he has positioned you in this present for something. In all of eternity, God said you will be a part of 2016, this present is for a reason. You see, we can refuse to obey God or, or cower in fear from his calling. And listen, he's still going to accomplish his agenda. Just like Mordecai said, if you don't help with this, it's gonna arise from some other place. He's going to accomplish his plan, but what happens is we pass up the fulfillment of our own life purpose and what God has for us, and even those closest to us miss out on an incredible work that God wanted to do in and through our lives. Erwin McManus puts it this way, if you wait for guarantees, the only thing that will be guaranteed is that you will miss endless divine opportunities. We all want miracles, and then we spend our lives avoiding the context in which miracles happen. We need to take some courage. Listen, if you are a mom of a new baby or an elementary kid, a middle school kid, high school kid, There's a lot of uncertainty. And so much of it is out of our control, right? Don't back down. Don't take the easy way out. You are that mother for such a time as this. You get to be a boss, a business leader, a teacher with influence. Things can be so uncertain. Finances can be tight. Listen, don't settle You are that boss, you are that leader for such a time as this. Listen, if you are a college student here or somewhere else, and it's so easy to just say, yeah, those were my college years, 
I'll change when I'm older. <clears throat> I'll get serious about God when I'm older. Listen, you are in that campus. You are in those classrooms. You are in those environments. You are in that workplace for such a time as this. Listen, maybe you have sensed God asking you to do something and it just seems like too much, right? Like, oh, that God wouldn't ask me that. The timing's not right. That would make things so uncomfortable. Listen, don't think for a second that God wouldn't ask something risky of you. He would. And who knows? You just might be the woman for such a time as this. Esther had a choice to make because courage is always a choice. Scene four, Braveheart. After hearing what Mordecai had to say, there's this change in Esther. And so she sent back a message telling Mordecai to have the Jewish people fast and pray for her for three days. And, and let's not underestimate the importance of having people pray for us when we need courage, when we're facing something. And then she said, when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I mean, talk about a shift. Talk about a choice to be courageous in five tiny verses, she goes from, oh no, 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 I can't do that, no way. This is too big of an ass, this is too risky. I could die just from approaching him too. I'm gonna go to the king and if I perish, I perish. She could have chickened out, she could have stayed in the castle, she could have stayed comfortable in her royal room and just seen what maybe would have happened. But she didn't. And no matter how many opportunities you think you may have missed, you think you've, you've been a chicken up to this point. You feel inadequate or underqualified. Maybe you've lived your whole life holding on so tightly in self-preservation mode. Listen, all of us could be one courageous decision away from changing our storyline. Whatever our past is, whatever our background, we can make a choice like she does. Esther said those powerful words, if I perish, then I perish. Um, I learned this, I, I did a Bethmore Bible study on Esther, anyone done that? 10 weeks in 30 minutes is what you're getting right now. Um, but I learned an exercise in that Bethmore study that just it literally has changed my life, changed my thinking, and I wanna share that with you. Um, using her sentence, if I perish, then I perish, I want you to think if blank, then blank. And in that first blank, I want you to think about your worst fear. Maybe it's your present fear what feels very out of control to you right now. You put that fear in that blank. Maybe it's the fear that just keeps coming back. And let me, want, let me tell you what the enemy wants us to think about that fear. He wants us to focus on it. He wants it to mess with us. He wants us to believe that if blank ever happened, then I would just be done. Then I could not recover. Then I would curl up in the fetal position and never come out of my room. I could never get up if blank happened. Anybody have those kind of fears? I've got a few of those kind of fears. You think about our families, our children, our husbands, we think, oh gosh, if that blank happened, then I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I could ever get back up. But when we believe that, that if our fears came to be that we would just be done, we put conditional trust on a God who is bigger than our blank. We cannot just trust him to help us avoid what we fear the most. We have to choose to trust him even if blank happens. That's what we put in that second blank. If blank, then God. If my worst fear happens, then God, he will be enough for me. Do we believe that? He will pick me back up. He will be my strength. He will say, come on. He will sustain me. He will be and do all that he has promised to be and do in my life. If my blank happens, I may be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed because my God is bigger than my blank and I will trust him. If blank, then God. So many of our fears have us paralyzed 
because we're not focused on our bigger God. Esther had resolved. She was not done. She said, if I perish, then I perish. Scene five is called, um, pardon the interruption. That's just for all of you Sports Center fans um, out there that are like me. So Esther's now calling the shots, right? Mordecai told her what to do. You go to the king and you, and you beg for mercy. But she doesn't come like, you know, as a beggar or in her negligee. She comes dressed in her royal robes as the queen of the Persian empire because she was created and she was positioned for such a time as this. And can you imagine her walking down that hallway? Can you imagine doing that? In every step, you're getting closer to coming into view to what is a life or death situation. And you know the lives of so many people are on the line, what hangs in the balance. You're praying in every step. And you know you think, if I stop even for a second, I'm running out of here. But she just kept putting one foot in front of the other. And maybe that's the thing that you need to hear this morning. Just take the next step in trusting God. While she comes into view, The guards are ready to strike. I mean, it was their job to know, like she's breaking the law right now. So they reach for their swords, and then what happens? The king holds out the gold scepter. And he asks her, Queen Esther, what do you want? Ask, and it's yours. And Esther says, if it pleases the king, let the king together with Haman, boo, come today to a banquet that I have prepared for him. And so the king calls Haman and they go to this banquet that Esther has prepared and there again he asks her, what do you want? Queen Esther asks and it's yours. But what Esther does is she asks for the king and Haman to come to another banquet the next day. Like, could we do this again? Like tomorrow, that's what I want. And so he agrees. I mean, can you kind of feel the tension building? There are lots of thoughts and theories on why Esther didn't just tell him what she wanted the first time. I mean, some people believe that she just chickened out. It was like, I don't know come to a banquet tomorrow you know it was just like I don't know what to do or maybe she was real discerning and she was feeling like the timing wasn't right the king was kind of in a bad mood we're not going to do this today some people think she was brilliant and she was trying to make the king suspicious on why she kept inviting Haman to their private dinners you know like making him jealous keeping him intrigued Whatever happened, the king left that banquet intrigued. Like, what does she want? Esther left the banquet, walking in that courage for the next day. But Haman, our villain, he left that banquet on cloud nine, okay? He was so puffed up about having dinner with the royal family, he couldn't shut up about it, right? And he got invited again. He's telling everybody. It says that he left the banquet happy and in high spirits. But all of that changed when he had to walk past the king's gate and see Mordecai still refusing to bow down to him. So Haman went home and he has a bunch of friends over, this party at his house, and he talks all about whining and dining with the king and queen. He says, oh, the queen, I was the only one else that the queen invited, but then my day was ruined by that Jew, Mordecai. So his wife, Zeresh, this is why we're not naming our kids Zeresh, and all of his friends (laughs) say to him, Here's an idea, if you're so frustrated, why don't you just have a gallows built 75 feet high, ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it, and then go to the king to this dinner and be happy, you won't have to see this guy again. So this suggests and delighted Haman, and he's like, okay, let's get to work, have the gallows built. Scene six, sleepless in Susa. That night, (laughs) the king had trouble sleeping. And he ordered an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign, do you remember that, that book? so it could be read to him. And guess which account was read? It was the account about Mordecai saving the king's life from those two guards that were plotting to kill him. Okay, so the king's having trouble sleeping. He needs a bedtime story. He would prefer it be something about him. He's like, bring me that book about me. Read about me, you know? And it just so happens that the story they start with is about how Mordecai and saved the king's life, and the king asks his attendants, what reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? Middle of the night, well none, they said. Nothing was ever done for him. Then the king heard someone in the outer court. You know, the the sun's coming up, it's dawn, here it is. The king said, who's in the court? Well now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. See, this is good stuff. So the king asked Haman, hey Haman, while I've got you here, what should I do for someone I wanna honor? And Haman thought, well, who would the king want to honor besides me? 
I would put his royal robe on him and I'd put him on the king's horse and put the royal crest on his head and, and the ring on his finger and lead him through the street shouting, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Excellent, said the king to Haman. Quick, take my robes and my horse and do just as you said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate of the palace. Leave out nothing you have suggested. <laughs> and Haman had to do it, right? Don't you wish you could have been there, right? Afterward, Mordecai returned to the palace gate. But Haman hurried home, dejected and completely humiliated. So we're gonna name our next scene after him, scene seven, the biggest loser. Um, <laughs> Haman is humiliated and he's dejected and he's reeling a little bit, like what's happening to my plan? It's kind of coming unraveled. Why did the king read that story? But he goes to the second banquet that Esther has prepared and as they're sitting there, the king asks, Queen Esther, what is it that you want? Ask and it is yours and she says, If I had found favor with you, grant me this, spare my life, spare my people, for we have been sold into destruction, slaughter, and annihilation. And the king says, who, where is the man who would dare do such a thing? And Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen, right? So the king gets up in a rage. This was his highest ranking official, his inside man. Obviously he'd never seen like season of 24 or whatever. He's just like, he can't believe it. He steps outside to his garden to kind of cool off a little bit. And while he's gone, Haman begins to beg Esther for his life. And it says, in despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining just as the king was returning from the palace garden. And this sent the king over the top. This was like a get off my wife, right, moment. (laughs) He even said, will he even molest the queen while she's with me in my house? I mean, it is not looking good for Haman. And one of the attendants standing near Pi sees how angry the king is and he has a suggestion. Have a gallows. There's a gallows over here. I don't know who built it last night, but there's this gallows. It's 75 feet high and it's by Haman's house. He made it for Mordecai who spoke up to help the king. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. I mean, come on, that's unreal, right? We've come to our final scene and that is scene eight, heroes. On that same day, The king gave Esther all of Haman's estate and Esther placed Mordecai over it. But because the king had already signed the edict against the Jews, um, he couldn't revoke it. So he had Mordecai issue a new decree that was translated into all the provinces and the headline read that on March 7th, Jews in every city had the right now to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill any armed force, nationality, or province that might attack them. So on March 7th, the two decrees of the king were put into effect and on that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. Scene eight is called Heroes. And while Mordecai and Esther display some amazing heroics, the real hero of the story is never mentioned. If you have ever studied the book of Esther, one of the most intriguing things about this book is that God's name is never mentioned in it. But don't confuse God's name not being in it with God not being in it. God is all over this story. And just like with every great drama, Behind the scenes, there's a writer, there's a producer, there's a director who knows every scene, is involved in every line, and is in complete control of what is going on, and J.J. Abrams has got nothing on our God, right? I mean, could it just so happen that Vashti is banished at the time when Esther's the right age to be picked for tryouts? I mean, could it just so happen that among all the beautiful women coming to the king for four years, Esther, the Jewish orphan girl, is chosen? I mean, could it just so happen that when the Jewish nation would face annihilation at the exact same time their queen happens to be Jewish? Could it just so happen that although it's against the law and the king did not have a reputation for tolerating disrespectful wives, Esther wins his favor and he gets that gold scepter? Could it just so happen that as a plot is being carried out to kill Mordecai, the king needs a bedtime story and it's about Mordecai? Could it just so happen that the gallows Haman built 
He was hanged on. Could it just so happen that all of this would take place at a time when the Jewish community was scattered and displaced that they could come together again and be strong? No, it couldn't just so happen. That is God. That is God working behind the scenes in everything. And I believe God chose to inspire this book without his name being mentioned in it so that we could take courage. Because maybe you are going through a season of your life right now and for the life of you, you do not know where God is in it. And you cannot find him. You don't see him on the page of your current story. He is working. He is there. Maybe you've been through that, right? You lived through something and for the life of you, you didn't know where God was and now you can look back and you can see his hand was all over it. I think he gave us the book of Esther so that we would know, even when we cannot see him on the page, he is here in your presence right now. Do not be afraid, you are not alone. If we are going to live courageous lives in our present, here's what we have to know. We don't have to be the hero. The hero is already and is always at work. We just have to be courageous enough to say yes to the role he's asking us to play for such a time as this. God, I thank you so much for every woman here that you just plucked out of eternity and said, this, this is the time I want you to live on this planet. God, I thank you for what every woman here was created and positioned to do. For every teacher, for every mother, for every wife, for every Bible study leader, for every foster parent, for every student in a classroom. God, what you have created and positioned us to do, may we be so courageous that our present fears, they're handed to someone so much bigger. And may we trust that even when we don't see you or know how you're working, that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.